So to get your attention, I'm going to start with an outlandish claim that happens to be true, which is that there's a part of our economy that's worth 10 times as much as every internet company ever started. And uh, uh, my friends and I happen to start one of the first billion dollar companies in this part of the economy that, uh, as it's changing very quickly. And uh, my topic is man-machine symbiosis, and we're talking about the new enterprise space. And for context, the company we started is called Palantir, which is a market leader in the intelligence and defense space. And it was created after 9-11 to address the false trade-off between stronger civil liberties and stronger defense. And it's made important contributions in those areas. And now the technology is being used in healthcare and in finance with Thomson Reuters and lots of other areas. But the core insight, or one of the core insights behind the starting of the company was that there's a lot of technology that's not valuable because it solves problems for you automatically. It's valuable because it helps people solve problems better. And this is very unintuitive to most people. Most people, when you see these giant systems, they're taking in data from everywhere and processing them in all these ways. They think the system should give you an answer. They think there should be a big red button, and you press the button, and the system should automatically find the trade. It should go ahead and search everything and automatically identify the terrorists. And that's how a lot of us see this really complicated technology. And that's actually not how it works at all. And the reason it doesn't work that way is these are problems with many, many layers of intellectual complexity and computers can't do that yet. Um, you need human analysts to solve a lot of these problems. And that's very unsatisfying to most technologists because as a technologist, you think, well, maybe your technology can't solve that problem. But if you show me what's going on, I'm going to figure out what the analysts are doing, and it's going to be some kind of logic. And I'm going to put that into the computer, and I'm going to automatically solve it for you. And that's what everyone always tries in these situations. But there's certain things that AI can't do. It can't write computer code for you. AI can't run a company. It can't manage an investigation. And so a good example of the background of this is uh, we were at PayPal earlier, about 10 years ago, and the Chinese and Russian mafia were stealing all of our money and all of our competitors' money. It was a really unprofitable business. So we were losing several million dollars a month. I was actually only an intern at the time, but I like to tell the story in the first person. What would happen is that you would go and use your credit card somewhere. In this case, the enterprising mafia is still stealing it from you at the ATM. There's hundreds of ways people get your credit card number and they put it online and the mafia takes it and runs it through the system and you see PayPal, $200, and you get really angry and you call up your credit card company and then PayPal has to give you the money back. But by that time, the mafia has taken the money out of the system and PayPal loses money. And if this only happened once, it wouldn't really be a big problem. But if they do this like 20,000 times, you start to lose lots and lots of money. And so you see this problem, and our competitors at Citibank and eBay and other people saw this problem, and you say, let's build a system that will teach the computer how to stop the bad guys. And it actually worked really well at first because there were just really simple ways they were doing it tens of thousands of times in a row. But the problem with these dynamic systems is you have adaptive adversaries, and so the bad guys would say, they're catching on to us, and let's change it. Let's do it a different way. And so once you start to deal with these really complex systems where the modeling and the rules and everything's changing really quickly, then it doesn't really work very well to have computers doing it. So you have to figure out a way to get people involved. But it's really hard to have people involved because you have 70 million users and 2 million transactions a day, and how does a person deal with that? And so ultimately what you end up having to do is you have to build technology to enable the people to be involved in solving the problem. And so we hired over 100 analysts. We built all these systems for basically how the analysts collaborate, how they visualize, how they search. And ultimately this combination of the machine and the computer um, made fraud go down by 90%. And of course, PayPal was sold to eBay for $1.5 billion. And all these people left PayPal and started like, a lot of the most important companies in the Silicon Valley. It's a very famous like, a network of alumni. And what we learned from this is to give them all of our money. And that you have to be really suspicious of the guy at your chess club who has a Russian accent and is really annoyed about your security protocols. This actually happened to our CEO at PayPal. But what we actually learned from this is that human intelligence is extremely important and that abstraction is really cool. And what I mean by that um, is that humans are really good at taking things and thinking of them at a high level and modeling these high level problems in ways that computers just simply cannot do. There's, there's things that the human brain is just way ahead of in, in th versus computers. Abstraction is also the foundation of computer science. It's basically, instead of having to sit and deal with ones and zeros all day, we create higher level concepts that enable us to manipulate information. And that's what's you know, created all these things that we do right now. Uh, one of my favorite examples of abstraction, just to belabor the point, is uh, because the sciences are all like one layer of abstraction on top of the other. So math, physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, every one of these kind of comes from the one below it. And like a neat example of breaking the barrier of abstraction is only in the last couple of years have we been able to take like really complicated quantum physics 
and model it and simulate it and figure out what would happen in a simple chemical interaction, which we already knew, but we're now actually calculating it directly. But in general, these are like completely different levels that we think on. And that, that's a good example of how I think about abstraction. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows what sits under math in the hierarchy here, but supposedly it's a, it's a turtle, and this turtle is all the way down. That's, anyway, that's something else. But the, <laughs> the, the, the key kind of abstraction we care about for this, uh, this new giant industry is uh, conceptual abstraction, where uh, we're using a, what we call the conceptual pyramid, where you have all this data spread out at the bottom in little pieces, and you have at the pinnacle, you have human insight, like the really high level top of abstraction. And so if you want to take the top of the pyramid, the things there that would, you know, the top of human insight, it's like really hard stuff, like tracing a cyber attack or stopping a terrorist. These have lots of pieces of the model. It's really hard to teach a computer how to do that. Like a really hard example for what a computer probably couldn't do is figure out how to keep your spouse happy. That's not an easy problem to model. Uh, for me, anyway. I don't, I don't have a spouse yet. Um, <laughs> uh, can we go back, back one more? And then the bottom, there's like simple examples, but basically it's uh, you know, simple things like sorting things, doing addition, parsing XML. That's stuff computers are really good at, and they have to kind of build that up to solve these higher level problems. Anyway, the other example I wanted to give here um, is there's like a chess piece that shows up. The, the other example I wanted to give here is, is a, in chess is a really good example of kind of modeling the world, the real world as well for analysis. And, and unfortunately, chess is not like infinitely complicated. So of course, computers do right now beat people. So like as the last 10 years, computers have been better at people. But what's interesting is that there's still parts of chess that people are much, much better at. And so even before computers tried to play chess, we had two areas of, of chess. We'd have tactics, which is like what's going to happen in the next five or 10 moves. And you had strategic play, which is like What's, how strong is my position? How am I positioning things for what's going to happen like 30 moves from now? And computers are really good at tactical play. They're not really good at strategic play. And wh what's interesting about that is that even with all the effort we've put into chess, if I take like a little phone with like a really crappy computer chess program and I compare that with a typical grandmaster, that'll be much, much better than the best computer in the world. So even though the computer overall beats people, if you help people a little bit with the tactics, they're still better than computers. So, that, so the, the best chess player in the world is a human and computer combined. This is true for a lot of different things. And then in, in general, like, there's 50 years ago, there was a guy named, named Lick Litter who predicted this dynamic when he said that man-computer symbiosis is an expected development and you know, coordination between human and machines. And he said, computing machines will do the routinizable work to prepare the way for technical and scientific insights by humans. And that's basically what we're finally starting to see now. And the data that we care about is conceptual data. That's what people are able to deal with, is these high-level concepts. And basically, we want to focus on what we're good at and let computers focus on what they do best. And so one way to look at like, technological progress recently that matters, and actually the technological progress that will matter the most as we go you know, throughout the century, is that computers are climbing the conceptual pyramid. And they're commoditizing the lower level work, and value is being pushed up into the higher levels. And uh, a good example of this is from Google. And so what Google did with PageRank is they made it so that people don't have to deal with as many lower level details when they do searches. When you do search, you're exposed to the concepts other people cared about. And so you, you're, you stay at the top of the conceptual pyramid instead of having to get down into the, the simple stuff. And this is also true in a lot of the really important areas, such as financial analysis, logistical planning, healthcare analysis, things in government. And so if we look overall at the, this enterprise kind of space in general, it's worth about $20 trillion, much bigger than the web. That whole space is changing right now where what we care about is the high-level analysis that's going on there and the technology that's allowing you to do the high-level analysis. This is really important stuff. And what this really means is that enterprise software is really important. And that seems like a really silly thing to say. Most of the time when you talk about enterprise software, it's, it's like you're talking about really boring. Well, you're talking about things that a lot of people traditionally consider to be really boring. And the reason is, is historically enterprise software was dealing with the bottom of, of that triangle. It's dealing with the really well-defined processes. So it's things like payroll or things like your purchase orders or dealing with your TPC reports or whatever it is. It's stuff that you don't want to have to do that's not actually helping you to create value necessarily. Whereas the new enterprise software is dealing with knowledge work and analysis and the things that actually do create value and they're really important. So suddenly this space is, is really interesting. And uh, one way of looking at this is that people understand the back end of this space really well. So people, I mean, there obviously is a lot of money being invested here. But when people invest money, they tend to invest in the stuff that's really simple to understand. Like everyone knows about the cloud, and everyone talks about the cloud, and there's a giant corporate international rain dance going on about how important this is. And also, you had you know a few weeks ago, there's this giant bidding war between HP and Dell over three par for storage. Backend stuff is really easy. Uh, it's not really easy to understand how you take this, this stuff and you kind of build up and what are the things you're building up to get to the top of the pyramid. And you have lots of really weird and difficult challenges. You have data integration which means not only you have lots of sources, but you have to figure out 
how to organize it or how to create an ontology that's relevant to the type of things you're working on. And then you'll have you know, different, different types of things where you have to build interfaces for what, what's happening. And then lots of really hard challenges for how do you keep someone at the top of the pyramid in terms of managing their knowledge so they don't have to come back to it and deal with the details. And uh, one way to think about this is to compare kind of Web 2.0, which is the you know, popular thing people talk about with technology right now, to the new enterprise space. And Web 2.0 is really hard to start a good Web 2.0 company. You have to have people operating at the top of the triangle. But in terms of using the technology itself, you're answering really simple questions. You're answering things like, you know, which of my friends has a new baby, or who's available to hire, or you know, things like that. Whereas on the top of the, uh, the enterprise you know, space, you're kind of trying to figure out how do I allocate $10 billion to this region of the global economy, or how do we fix this problem in Afghanistan as a commander with massive amounts of information about what's going on there, or you know, how do we track and stop the spread of this disease? These are much bigger problems that involve lots and lots of pieces, and how you create technology for that is completely different than how you answer these really simple questions online. And so here are some examples of interfaces at the top of the conceptual pyramid. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of seeing things like this, and they think, oh, there's these cool visualization companies in the enterprise space. They're helping us visualize things better, and that's not it at all. It's like, to get to the top of the pyramid, you need to go through all four of those pillars and put the data in the right forms and do all these other really hard things. And finally, once you get everything organized in the right way, that you can deal with the concepts, you can expose the concepts to people, and, and, these, are some, and these are some examples of those. And uh, so in, 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 in summary, we have this machine, machine symbiosis trend that is extremely important right now. And this is most important in the enterprise analytical space, the challenges that are focused there. And if you, if you care about the economic aspects of this, if you think of the web, a lot of people who made the most money were the ones that created effective networks. And it's the same kind of thing in the enterprise space. So one example of network is when my colleague spoke at TED, we talked about how the Dalai Lama came to, came to us and our friends and had this problem with people hacking into his computer. And we traced this network and found this giant international spy network. And the, way, the ways people now collaborate, who are the good guys, to stop things like that from happening is a network of rich collaboration of people working at the top of the conceptual pyramid with a very specialized tool. So that's an example of a network in this space. But in general, basically, the most important problems in the 21st century in technology are going to be people creating technology that enables, other, that enables you to do analysis at the top of the conceptual pyramid to solve these really hard problems. And that's what a lot of us are working on. I try to spend my time building networks in that space and, fi and finding places to do so. That's it.